242,000 people have mental ill health or are recovering from mental ill health at any one time. 20% of New Zealand, uh, no, 2,000, let me add a zero to that, 20,000 people in New Zealand use and understand New Zealand Sign Language, which is why it's so awesome that we have sign interpreters here today and deaf people in our audience. 168,000 people are blind or have low vision. And one of my colleagues on the panel today is disability specialist and advocate Robin Hunt, who has low vision. Arts Access moves around New Zealand, and this is a picture from when we brought with us uh, people who we call accessibility advocates into Auckland Art Gallery talking to the staff about what's going to work for them. More statistics tell us that there were audio described performances and events in New Zealand and Judith Jones is going to be talking about that today and also tomorrow. There were 39 events in New Zealand in arts and cultural sector that were sign interpreted and there were four relaxed performances like the one with the child surrounded with the orchestra that I showed you a moment ago. I'm going to ask Neil from Passion Art in a moment to read a statement from the New Zealand Disability Strategy. This is set up by the New Zealand Government through the Office of Disability Issues because we understand, disabled people understand that the New Zealand society can be and is disabling. We don't have disabled people so much as the society and the barriers that are faced are disabling. So if we create a vision, as the strategy has, it has a vision that says if we follow the strategy and if we work together, this society will be... Based on respect and equality, we have moved forward from an exclusion tolerance and accommodation of disabled people to a fully inclusive and mutually supportive society. That's great. So one of the ways that we do this is we invite people with disability and impairments into our place. This is a meeting, a workshop that was held at Canterbury Museum where the staff and disabled advocates from the local community got together and talked about what they really wanted and how this place can be more accessible and more inclusive. There's another quote. Disabled people are integrated into community life on their own terms. This means that equal opportunities are assured, but individual choices are available and respected. The abilities of disabled people are valued and not questioned. So one of the places that this happens is at our National Museum Te Papa, which does, as many of museums have started to do, sign interpreted tours. Another really important thing for museums as cultural hubs of activity and welcoming in is to have events and again at Te Papa Disability Pride Week happened on the Marae and started from the Marae at Te Papa and then it spread out into a variety of cultural experiences. That's a very good way of bringing people in for their events. Where do you sit on the accessible journey? Are you the producer that has the idea that we could make this exhibition, this thing, more accessible? Are you a parent who would like your child or your relative to have ease of access to the same stuff, the same information that able-bodied people have, but because you have a disability you might feel excluded? <coughs> so, first of all, I'm going to introduce my colleague Claire Noble. Claire Noble is the coordinator of the national regional network called Arts for All. And she's going to set up an invitation for you so that you can find ways to develop or maintain or strengthen the pathway that you're on to make your place more accessible for disabled people. My name is Claire, 
and I work at Arts Access Aotearoa. And for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce you to the awesomeness that is the Arts for All National Network. Woo! Excited. So, the Arts for All National Network is divided up into five regions. Auckland, Taranaki, Wellington, Canterbury and Otago. And twice a year I zoom around to these different regions and I run uh, network meetings. And at these network meetings the aim is to discuss and explore how we can increase access and inclusion in the arts. And that's a, it's such a valuable, um, play, a valuable meeting to go to. There's, you can share successful projects, you share ideas, we learn from each other, each other, we develop partnerships, um, and you take away some fantastic resources. And we've got a bunch of those resources at the back of the room on the table. And please take them away. We'll make our van a whole lot lighter when we go back to Wellington. So, um, so can I get a hands up of who has attended Nuts for All Network meeting before? Awesome. Ah, oh, that's exciting. Cool. So, at these network meetings, there are representatives from arts venues, um, like we've got Wellington City Gallery, Caleb I saw you before, or um, so we've got arts organisations, venues, festivals, uh, tutors, artists, as well as representatives from the disability sector um, and disability services, so like CCS Disability Action or Deaf Aotearoa. And we also have people from the community who have a disability and are very passionate about accessibility and inclusion. So, uh, the pictures that I've been showing you on the screen are from the different network meetings. And um, this one was a recent one in Hawara, so the Arts Royal Taranaki region. Anybody from Taranaki here today? Woo! Represent. Excellent. <laughs> So this picture here is at the Auckland War Memorial Museum. So this is the Arts for All Auckland Network meeting. And we have about 25 people sitting around a long table and they're all learning New Zealand Sign Language. Did anybody learn New Zealand Sign Language during New Zealand Sign Language Week? Yeah, a few hands. Does anybody know what sign uh, the museum is? What's... Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> museum. I like it. So, it's very strong, isn't it? <laughs> so, this is a page from our Arts Access um, Advocates uh, site, and this features leaders who experience barriers to accessing the arts. So, there's fantastic tools on here, there's um, stories, blogs, um, Robin Hunt is on there, and there's some fantastic videos. <laughs> So we believe it's key that the voices of disabled people are included all of the time. And I think the Disabled Persons Assembly our slogan, nothing about us without us, sums that up. So I'd like to um, show you a short clip that is featured on our Arts Access Advocate page and uh, uh, representing two very strong leaders in Arts Access, um, Accessibility in the Arts. One of them, Philip Paxton, who is having an inclusive party later on, so it's pretty exciting. So just bear with me, I'm just going to bring up the... the so this is your Arts for All Network homepage. So once you've chosen the region that you'd like to sign up to, um, you can click on, for example, the Arts for All Wellington Network, and you can see a list of members. So what's really handy about this is that if you go to a network meeting and you had a really good chat with that lady at the gallery that was really interesting and want to connect with her again, I can't remember her name, but know that it was a particular, you know, remember the gallery, you can find that list, that name on the list. What's also handy is at my uh, network meetings I talk about other accessible projects that are happening around the country. So you can flick on the other Arts for All Network pages and uh, find that person who did that awesome thing down in Dunedin and connect with them. Um, so what I do also, as I said, I, I talk about different things that happen around the country uh, and locally as well. So this is uh, one image of uh, Julius Jones um, at work doing her sensory tour. Um, and as you see the AD, which is the International Sign for Audio Description, 
Judith Jones is the guru of audio described tours, so watch out. <laughs> At uh, Gabbert Brewster Lynn Life Centre, they, pro they provide sense art tours, which is actually a combination of audio described tours and New Zealand sign language tours. And they do this for every new exhibition. But they also did um, something very simple, and this is another thing that we talk about at the meetings, is what really simple ideas that you can do, simple steps to become more accessible. And this is one example, um, Sue, um, there is, Sue Cunningham there is looking at large printed labels that are provided at the reception. So you can just borrow those labels that connect up with the different exhibit, exhibits and then walk around and drop it back off at reception again. And Teresa Cooper, who we have here today. Teresa um, is deaf, and she learnt through the creator, um, curator of Rembrandt Remastered about Rembrandt. And then she put together a tour and then provided deaf tours to her local Wellington deaf community. Uh, is anybody here from Auckland War Memorial Museum? I feel like I've mentioned it. Oh, party down here. Okay. <laughs> so, InfoWave. So, a few years ago, um, they provided an exhibition, um, and this is a really great example of accessible technology where they downloaded an app on their phone, scanned a QR code that was next to the um, exhibit, and then you could read the label in different languages, including New Zealand Sign Language, or English, or Te Reo Māori, and so on. And finally, my final New Zealand example is Canterbury Museum, who've done some fantastic accessibility initiatives um, recently. Um, Outside In was all about being fully inclusive. If you're an artist, you could submit a work. Um, there's no barrier to who would exhibit. Uh, representatives from Christchurch Men's Prison, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, uh, fine arts graduates. Soon after that, Richard was invited back to um, present to senior staff about accessibility and inclusion. And soon after that, he was asked to help develop an accessibility policy, which is something that we can help you out with as well. And only a few weeks ago, to the left is Prudence Walker from CCS Disability Action. So this is your Arts for All Network homepage. So once you've chosen the region that you'd like to sign up to, um, you can click on, for example, the Arts for All Wellington Network and you can see a list of members. So what's really handy about this is that if you go to a network meeting and you had a really good chat with that lady at the gallery that was really interesting and want to connect with her again, I can't remember her name, but know that it was a particular, you know, remember the gallery, you can find that list, that name on the list. What's also handy is at my uh, network meetings I talk about other accessible projects that are happening around the country. So you can flick on the other Arts for All Network pages and uh, find that person who did that awesome thing down in Dunedin and connect with them. Um, so what I do also, as I said, I talk about different things that happen around the country uh, and locally as well. So this is uh, one image of uh, Judith Jones um, at work doing her sensory tour um, and as you see the AD which is the international sign for audio description Judith Jones is the guru of audio described tours so watch out <laughs> at uh, Gabbert Brewster Lynn Life Centre they, pro they provide sense art tours which is actually a combination of audio described tours and New Zealand sign language tours and they do this for every new exhibition but they also did um, something very simple, and this is another thing that we talk about at, at the meetings, is what really simple ideas that you can do, simple steps to become more accessible. And this is one example, um, Sue, um, there is, Sue Cunningham there is looking at large printed labels that are provided at the reception. So you can just borrow those labels that connect up with the different exhibit, exhibits and then walk around and drop it back off at reception again. And Teresa Cooper, who we have here today, Teresa um, is deaf, and she learnt through the creator, um, curator of Rembrandt Remastered about Rembrandt, and then she put together a tour and then provided deaf tours to her local Wellington deaf community. Uh, is anybody here from Auckland War Memorial Museum? I feel like I've mentioned it. Oh, 
party down here. Okay. <laughs> so InfoWave. So a few years ago, um, they provided an exhibition. Um, and this is a really great example of accessible technology where they downloaded an app on their phone, scanned a QR code that was next to the um, exhibit, and then you could read the label in different languages, including New Zealand Sign Language, or English, or Te Reo Māori, and so on. And finally, my final New Zealand example is Canterbury Museum, who've done some fantastic accessibility initiatives um, recently. Um, outside In was all about being fully inclusive. If you're an artist, you could submit a work. Um, there was no barrier to who would exhibit. Uh, representatives from Christchurch Men's Prison, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, uh, fine arts graduates. Soon after that, Richard was invited back to um, present to senior staff about accessibility and inclusion. And soon after that, he was asked to help develop an accessibility policy, which is something that we can help you out with as well. to enable listeners to create images, picture in their own mind's eye and make their own meaning. You can audio describe a painting, a huge model of a Kiwi soldier frozen in time, a weta, a space, an event, a performance, theatre, ballet, even circus. You can bring in additional information or work alongside others to deliver it as part of a wider experience. What can it sound like? I'm going to audio describe a modern replica of Te Mana Tukutuku, the traditional Māori kite. It's here, well, at Te Manua, in the Te Rangi Whenua Gallery. A panoramic photographic image of the landscape of the Manawatu, Rangataiki and Horu Whenua regions covers the gallery walls. Many of the kite materials come from this landscape. The mottled brown flight feathers of Te Kahu, the hairy hawk, with their strong white shaft. Branches of the shrubby manuka, and the soft brown stalks of raupo, or bulrush. A manukahu, or hawk kite, hangs down from the roof, about two arms length above us. Rangatane carver and artist Stephen Kawana made this kite in 1999. It's in the form of a hovering bird, flattened, with outstretched wings. If you stood with your arms reaching out from your shoulders, with your legs pressed together from thigh to knee, and your lower legs angling down to your feet, set about 35 centimetres apart, about the width of a tea towel, then you're forming something like this kite's shape. Only its wingspan is four metres, and each is about 35 centimetres wide, tapering a little at a softly curved tip. Several feathers reach out beyond each end, mimicking the distinctive upturned wingtip of the bird itself. Its body is two metres long, and about 45 centimetres wide, widening towards the base. The wings cross the body on your shape around the upper chest, and set here the kite has a carved human face, about life size, looking downwards. It's made from red-brown totara wood, solid, perhaps five centimetres thick. Its strong eyebrow line adds impact to the steady gaze of the iridescent power shell eyes set below. The face is incised with a man's moko, picked out in black. The lips are closed. A semicircle of feathers fans out across the top of the head, down to eye level on either side, its arc covering the upper part of the body. The wings in the body are created from a manaku frame with rail post flats. Thin, bra thin branches lie end to end in five long lines across the length of the wings, set at even intervals. Sets of six twigs are laid across these at a 90 degree angle, evenly placed along the length. All are lashed together with neck stitchings of fibre cord. Seven branch lines lie down the length of the body, also braced by twigs lashed across them. Behind the frame, short slats of rapo lie side by side vertically to fill out the wings and body. Their top and bottom edges form the outlines of the kite. Their light colour and weight visually replicate feathers 
and create the sail for the wind to catch and take the kite on high. Here and there one lies a little out of line, or a piece is missing, as if the feathers have been ruffled in flight. The kite body ends in a soft curve, an upside down U. A thick plait of rope was attached along this curve. The two outer branches of Manuka framing travel on beyond the end of the body to form two legs. Each ends with a cluster of twigs for claws. The kite bridle is a Y shape of three fibre cords, attached to the frame a little out from the feathers on each side of the head, and just below the centre of the body, meeting up below the chin. This is where you'd attach the flying line. This gallery is near the museum entry. We can often hear people coming and going, but when it's quiet, there's a faint sound of air moving high above us. I think it might be placed here as the ambient sound of the wind roaming down the landscape, but it's just the air conditioning. Still, high above us, Te Manukahu moves ever so gently, riding the currents. Audio description was an integral part of the Ngātua Arts to Public Pilot Tour for low vision and blind visitors that I was part of. We wanted to develop a model for future tours and knew the only place to start was by creating a relationship with that community. Fortuitously, we knew all about arts access Aotearoa and Claire helped link us up with people who were prepared to share their thoughts and experiences with us and act as our coaches throughout the pilot so we could use their perspectives to extend our understanding and tailor our tour product. Our Puppet team, which was led by Kate Button, who's here somewhere, then in the Public Programs team, uh, included uh, curators and conservators. And here's what I heard throughout our first conversations with the reference group. We want the opportunity to experience art in the gallery, as others do, and create our own meaning from that experience. We talked about the things that had prevented this sort of engagement for them in the past, how we could best support this quality of encounter with our artworks. We visited and discussed the gallery spaces and current works on display and chose works for the tour. We discussed the most effective ways for them to connect with the art at a more satisfying level. We thought about what we might need to do in the gallery space for them to be comfortable and able to focus on the tour, like turning off some ambient sounds, including alarms, and providing places to sit down. We heard about how some people responded to changes of light intensity, needing extra time to move through that transition. We found out how they'd like to receive accessible communications and what time of day would suit most people for the tour. We talked about what we couldn't do. It's not possible always to deliver on the ideal experience for every individual. And I believe it's essential to be important and upfront about this. We can't do everything. We refined the tour to a set of works that reflected the essence of the season's ideas in a variety of mediums and without too much travel between them. There's a lot you just can't touch. But building on what our participants told us made for meaningful connection for them, we created a rich sensory experience. I already described our path through the spaces and each work as we gathered around it. Curators their discussions on the art, the artists, the cultural context. Conservators brought in things we could touch, like part of a complex picture frame and a tivaivai, which you may have seen in the picture, and created some props, including a canvas layered with thick swirls of oil paint, such as one artist had used to evoke curling, crashing waves. The pilot tour ended up with a morning tea, so we could hear feedback from our participants. It was entirely intentional that this pilot work should start and end with conversations with our audience. Through working very closely with this reference group, who we were so ready to challenge us, state their expectations, and let us know what worked for them, I learned more about how to be an ally for a community and using my skills in that context. Audio description is difficult to create. It's a fabulous challenge for a word person like me. I love doing it. I collect words. Did you know, for example, that? This piece of your handy edge part from the top of your finger to the, the top of your wrist is called the blade. I learned that from a sign language uh, booklet that I picked up when I was doing some training with the Gavit Brewster team. I want to give some, a really big shout out for because they're working very hard to connect with their communities and pull together some really interesting tours for every exhibition that they have. I collect words, yep. Um, I'm not so much a number person. And I've worked hard for the pilot to come up with tangible things to describe shape and size rather than numbers. It works for me. That can be tricky. If I say it's the size of a mandarin, you think about one of those tiny
tight little mandarins, it's really hard to peel. Or if you've got in your mind's eye one of those big fat puffy ones that are very easy to peel. Maybe not so sweet. Mandarins are not all the same. Words can be tricky. I have to remember as I hone each sentence, each word must work for someone else. So here I am. None of my colleagues have heard me do any audio description. We simply haven't had time. I did the first training and writing with my colleague Bruce Roberts, who's here today, and I just convinced them all I was going to be able to do that. So I have a, a series of, of senior colleagues. I can see beyond me one of our senior directors, and I'm about to read it out. As I read out the third sentence from my script, alongside the very first work of the tour, saying it was the size of a large beach towel, someone interrupted me. How big is that in centimetres? They asked. Hooray for the nearby label. Maysoon Zayed, a Muslim woman comedian from USA, who TED talk is, I've got 99 problems, palsy is just one of them. She understands the Allies challenge. The number one thing I tell Allies is, when the community you're advocating for is speaking, listen, this is not about you. A true advocate does not make it about themselves. I heard. I've never left the measurements out again. I keep listening and watching and learning from my audiences about how audio description can develop a more meaningful relationship with them. And it's not just this audience. You will have heard Rachel talk you through what was in the slides, and we're short on time. She wanted to draw your attention to particular things that were meaningful, the reason she'd taken those photos and shown them to you in this context today. She was audio describing as she went along. I incorporate elements of audio description into so many of my front of house engagements with all sorts of visitors. And I've got a lot better at explaining people how to move across the museum simply by thinking in an audio describing way. Artist Max Gimlet says of his work, completion is the front door. The final editor is letting go of the work when it goes to the audience for them to complete within themselves. And that's audio description in a nutshell. I'd very much like to thank my wonderful panellists for today's presentation. Uh, as you've heard, there are resources at the back. I'd like you to devour them, take them away. We only have 10 of those books. They're ready for you. You've been wonderful to us because you've waited for your lunch. Kia ora, and we'll see you throughout the conference.